morning, everyone. I'm actually impressed there's this many people in the room considering it's the last day of RSA conference and you're all probably exhausted. So thank you, we really appreciate you coming this morning. Uh, hopefully we'll keep it entertaining. Um, but to start, we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll get right into it. Sure, hi, I'm uh, Denise Taylor. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Privacy Vaults Online and we're known in the marketplace as Privo. And we operate a trust mark service for compliance, helping companies get compliant with all the regulations they have to deal with. And then uh, we deliver an identity and consent management service to process children's data, give them login credentials, you know, handle identity verification and parents' consent. I'm really happy to be here today. So I have the pleasure to present with Denise. I'm Angel Grant, um, VP of Security over at F5. Um, just a little context from my background. I grew up in financial services, um, designed one of the industry's first online payments application where I went to a whole bunch of banks and said, people are gonna do this online payments thing. They told me I was crazy. No one's gonna bank online, pay do payments online. Clearly that took off, then a lot of crime started to happen. Um, so I started working with a variety of different cybersecurity vendors integrating into my payments application. RSA was one of them. I ended up moving over to RSA, uh, working on a variety of different products over there, um, ranging from a federated authentication products to our fraud product lines, um, the list goes on. Then I, now I'm over at F5. So I'm gonna start this session with something you never wanna hear from a presenter on the last day of a conference, when you're exhausted and you just got your butt out of bed to come here, is that I don't know what the metaverse is. I don't know what Web3 is. Do any of you? <laughs> right, right? So in preparation for this, we talked to a whole bunch of people and it's, it's almost comical. We're like, well, tell me about what the metaverse is. And everyone, I, and this, you know, try it yourself. Everyone has a different description of it. So I wanted to spend just a quick moment to explain kind of when we're using that term and concept, like what we mean by that. So when I'm talking about Web3, I'm talking about kind of the journey of the evolution of the web. So again, I came from a financial services background when I used to work at a bank. I managed inside sales and service for our mortgage department. So Web 1.0, that was when it was like a big deal. We were able to put our mortgage rates on the line. And that was huge. That was, that was really controversial too. That was all we could do. So it was read. When Web 2 came out, we could read write. It, took, it was a painful process, but we were able to get the bank to actually let us do mortgage prequals online or ultimately mortgage applications. So that was the evolution of Web 2. Web 3, the vision, and I'm still saying vision because I don't think it's come to fruition, is to have it be more of that decentralized, the next generation of the web. So you can actually own your information and have it more in a way that's controlled by you versus right now where it's more centralized and owned by a handful of companies, including all your data. So that's kind of conceptually when I, we're talking about Web3, what we're talking about. Metaverse is a byproduct of Web3 in the context that we're using. So sometimes you'll hear us say Web3, sometimes you'll hear us say Metaverse. In the vision of the Metaverse, it is not AR, it is not VR. You can engage in the Metaverse in other means as well, like a mobile device. So when you hear VR, virtual reality, think of it completely immersed in that experience. In AR, think about digital overlay in real world. So two examples of that would be uh, Ikea. They have the visualizer app. So like if I wanted to look at a new couch for my living room, I put it up, I'm like, oh, okay, that looked cool here, or that, that couch looks awful there. Uh, another example of that would be Pokemon Go, which is probably the first you know, great example of that. So with that said, now that we kind of level set on that, the, question next, the next question always comes up is like, are people actually investing in this? Are people actually spending money in this? And the reality is, yeah. Right now, people are spending over $54 billion annually on this. And again, criminals follow the money. So people are spending $54 billion in virtual goods. And people are investing just in the first half of the year of 2022, just the first half, 120 billion was spent on building out infrastructure and uh, capabilities within these worlds. And you hear um, addressable market numbers ranging from five trillion 
to, like, I thought I saw one that was like 20 trillion by 2030. Um, so there is investment there. So the next question that usually comes up, and this is, this is actually meant to hypnotize you, um, that graph there. No. So the next question is, okay, great, there's business cases, but like, what does that really look like? And don't worry, this, this graph here, the context of putting this graph up here for you guys is to really emphasize the point that there's different types of environments that people engage with in the metaverse. Um, there's Web 2 type of environments. What you're seeing in the upper right quadrant, that's the Web 2 cohort. Um, this is a graph created by a company called the Metaverse. They're monitoring um, about 190 so different um, environments that are developing over the course of the past couple of years. And there's about 520 monthly active users engaged in all these. So upper right, that's a Web 2 cohort. That's mostly populated like through the Minecrafts, Fortnites, and Roblox of the world. In the upper left, that's more the Web3 cohort, more built out on, a block, on the blockchain. There, this, that cohort is um, kind of interesting because there was about 95 in that population all offering pretty much the same thing, not interoperable. Many of them have in-loop currency, that means Think um, Fortnite V-Bucks, you can only use that currency within that world. And so, the, in our opinion, there's a lot of uh, players in that space there, and it'll be interesting to see what happens with them over the course of time. All right, so that's great. There's people in there, they're doing stuff. What are they actually doing? What are some of the business models? Most people think of the metaverse, they think gaming. The reality is all different industries are engaging right now. And all different industries are exploring, a lot of them is more about doing it from a brand perspective to put their failures out there. I, I equate it again to like the early days of the internet. People are like, yeah, we'll put our mortgage rates up there. They're trying to figure out what the right business models are, but they don't want to fall behind. So some examples of different industries, we see the retail industry heavily engaging, engaging in there. Uh, one of the ones that stood out to me that I thought was kind of interesting, and one I would never really associate with Metaverse was um, Bloomingdale's. Like, that's a company that's been around 150 years. When I saw that, I was like, wow, I guess they know a thing or two about reinventing themselves as they've lasted 150 years. But you're also seeing the Walmarts and Targets of the world out there. Um, you're seeing Nike have their uh, swoosh NFT sneakers. And actually, my son came home a couple weeks back. He's like, mom. Tommy lost his $300 ba basketball sneakers. I was like, well, go back to the court and go look around for it. Like, his mother's gonna be pissed. He's like, no, no, his digital ones. I'm like, he spent $300 on digital shoes? <laughs> I wouldn't spend that on my son's basketball sneakers. But he got matching, he wanted to match his NFT basketball shoes to the ones he was playing, or his basketball, I don't know. I, that's not something I would spend my money on with kids. Uh, so retail, it's very, you know, they're trying, testing out a lot of different models. Um, you're, you're seeing with entertainment fully utilizing this. So um, Grammy Week they, in Las Vegas, they had the red carpet experience. You could take pictures with stars. You could um, fly over the Las Vegas Strip. It was really immersive. And even in the sporting world, with uh, the Super Bowl, there was Verizon and Pepsi actually had Web3 immersive experiences during halftime. And FIFA fully embraced it to make attending World Cup games more immersive and engaging and equitable for people who simply couldn't afford to attend in person. So there's a lot of different models there, but the biggest one for minors that we're, we're seeing is um, the ed tech world really exploring this to have that more immersive experience of imagine that you're teaching um, history or geography, you can have that experience. You're walking through Rome, walking through the Colosseum, um, and then you're also seeing the re uh, real estate industry having, they're selling land, virtual land is a thing. It, I, I, if anyone's interested, I'm thinking about starting up like a virtual Airbnb so you can like rent out a virtual house in Rome while you have that virtual experience. <laughs> I'm thinking that's gonna be a thing. So clearly there's a lot of different um, business models out there. And the interesting thing is with all those business models and those graphs I showed you, who's really engaging with those 520 uh, yeah, that's right, monthly Angel. users? Um, and I'm just gonna jump in here for a second and then we'll come back. 
Um, you know, when I saw this slide in LinkedIn, a friend, my friend Nick Mitham that's uh, with Metaverse, I just looked at it and said, right, here we go again. Average age, 12 years old. Uh, the example you just gave of FIFA, but if you go to their website, you have to be 13 to engage with them or with their mobile apps. So the reality is that 80% of the monthly active users, or 454 million of them, are under the age of 18 and with an average age of you know, 12. And that's pretty alarming when you think of one in three internet users are minors. Um, I might call them little fraudsters if I'm at a, I'm at a security conference. Um, you know, that's a lot of uh, uh, vulnerable people out there masquerading around at an age that's older. Because what's key here is that that may be their age, but they're not that age in the databases that they've entered to get where they are. So. Yeah, and actually, I'm just jumping back to the, the bullseye, you know, so we were saying 95 worlds on that left side, the cohort side. And mm -hmm. Walmart. Or, you know, just uh, you know, tried to make a move into the metaverse, and they've got what two two sort of areas, yeah. but one of them just had so much pushback from the advocacy groups about marketing to children. But of course, you know, marketing to children um, is uh, is a talking point, but it happens every day. Uh, they're really active um, in in the way that they are buying and and, yeah. and in commerce and the like. But they had to pull out because they didn't think about it in advance. You know, they didn't really think about the perception side of it. So I think companies are going to have to get it right before they jump in. Yeah, and even like what we were talking about the, on the crypto wallet side, if you engage in crypto, you're supposed to be 18. Now, you have uh, over 80% of people engaging in environments where crypto wallets are being accepted. Are they over 18? Based on the numbers we're seeing, you know, again, the little it, frosters. It, well, you know, and I, it, it's a... It's a, the next digital fake ID. So what happens today is kids go off to you know, one of the big platforms, get themselves a login credential, a social credential, and they really use that as their fake ID to go everywhere. And companies are, you know, if they are directed to children, they're not supposed to even allow for social logins. And when I say children in our country, 12 and under, we'll talk about that in a bit. But yeah. it's the next fake ID, that, that wallet. Yeah. So we were, we were having um, interesting conversations like, okay, so there's business model out there, but are we ready? And so at F5, we were actually really interested in this. So we did a, a, a survey with YouGov trying to dig into, you know, what, what does this look like? What's the reality? So the survey we conducted, we reached out to a lot of IT decision makers, and we saw about 50% of the respondents came back, said they were either in the metaverse or plan to be within the next five years. And so when we dug into that to see if they were ready and what is the biggest concern of Roblox as they're building this, their strategy out, they were saying security and privacy are their two biggest concerns, right? So let's click into each one of those. I'm going to talk through the security side and we'll pivot to Denise to talk through the privacy side. So from a security perspective, what we saw was that the respondents said the security complexities, they're just simply not ready for it. But the most alarming part was 37% who are engaging are already experiencing some form of attack. All right, so what kind of attacks are we seeing? To start, you gotta remember that cybercrime, and again, you've probably heard this throughout the conference, it's more psychology than technology. And anytime new technology does come out, they know that they can manipulate the people who are engaging with that, as well as the people who are managing that, because it's a moment to disrupt because people don't know that they should be going there configuring their privacy um, policies and various things. It's a learning cycle. So what we're seeing is a lot of the same tactics just being applied to this channel. A perfect example of what's old is new. So when the internet first came out, a big thing was domain squatting. I remember being in college and one of my friends, he just sat in his dorm room all day, scooped up the Fortune 500 domains and made a ton of money. We're seeing the same thing right now with the Web3 domains, where they're going in there, scooping it up. Not in this, a lot of cases, it's not intended to make a lot of money. It's to um, make a lot of money to sell it back to the companies. It's to conduct some kind of fraud or crime. So the good thing is the top three uh, Web3 blockchain organizations have gone in and planted the top 100,000 domains to secure those. 
so criminals can't go ahead and scoop those up. So if you are planning on in setting up a business model within the environments, I recommend you go out there and get your domain. Um, but also a lot of the other attacks that we're seeing are more along the lines of the traditional account takeover techniques. Uh, one example of that would be the amount of phishing attacks that we're seeing. There was a phishing attack targeting, um, pretending to be a Pokemon Go app. The email went out, you click on that, download this awesome app. When you download it, you end up downloading a rat or a remote access tool. So you're seeing that. We're also seeing MetaMask being heavily ta ta uh, targeted with emails going out saying, hey, you need to confirm your crypto wallet, click here. When you click on it, a, a fake login page comes up, another form of digital skimming. You go in there, username, password, but then they also ask for your MetaMask key. And once you give that up, you give it up. Game over. So we're seeing a lot of those types of targeted account takeover types of attacks. But then there's also attacks already emerging as you're engaging within these metaverse type of environments. And one of the most concerning ones for me is the evolution of deep fakes and the, the potential of harm to children in that, or not just children, to everyone in that. Um, you, there were several great sessions around deep fakes at the conference. It, the technology's there, and it can be used to manipulate somebody when they're in the environment, or it also can be used to conduct new account fraud depending upon your business model. So a whole new level of really knowing your customers and fraud detection type of tools will be needed over the course of time. But the biggest one that we talked about that concerns us is the fidgetal, and that's the combination of fake, of physical and digital combined. Mm -hmm. So this is where we're seeing fidgetal stalking, where somebody starts engaging within these environments, and of course you're letting your guard down more because you're in a virtual environment. You can easily socially engineer somebody in these environments, and that can easily translate into the physical world. And for minors, that can be real. But it can also go reverse, too, where a minor can game you and uh, I don't know if you wanted to share your story on that. Oh, oh my little BART story. L yeah. I was uh, you know, trying to make my way here from the airport, getting warnings from everyone that was on the plane with me. And uh, so I you know, chatted up with a fellow who's graduated from Berkeley, and he said, I you know, of course told him what I, what I do, children's privacy, and the kind of talk we're going to have. And that had him, in his mind, go to uh, two guys that worked for him, He's a Navy, he was in the Navy for eight years, and two of his sailors got in some trouble. They were uh, ultimately cleared. Um, but as adults, they went to a dating app service. They had um, what, what I might say a robust and immersive relationship with the person on the other side. And at some point, the person said, hi, I'm a minor, send $1,000, or I'm going to turn you in and get you in a lot of trouble. And it turned out at the end of that that it truly was a minor that was doing it. So adults need protection from minors as well, right? If I go to the bar, I sit down at the, uh, have a beer, I look to my left, I'm not striking up a conversation with a 12-year-old, right? But in digital and in the metaverse, that's absolutely what's happening or what will happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so that's a great example. Again, the physical and digital worlds evolving and coming together and we're gonna have more and more of that immersive experience where it's kind of blurred all into one. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But there's also other examples of attacks where um, we're seeing a lot of fake and stolen goods out there. So we're seeing almost like you get a fake Rolodex. We're seeing fake NFTs being bought and sold. Um, there's a lot of counterfeiting bots that are creating these, putting up promotions for people to click. And with NFTs, a lot of people aren't very familiar with how those actually work or what those actually are, but it sounds really cool and they wanna be able to say they have an NFT. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of fake goods uh, type of things being developed with that. Um, from a bot perspective, we're seeing a lot of different types of variations of bots that are were used in the normal digital channels with like the web and mobile app type of channels that are targeting um, these worlds as well where there's the fake promo bots. There's um, the promotion bots where it will, the goal of it was to either increase the valuation of NFT or decrease it, depending upon what the resale strategy is. So we're starting to see those types of things emerge um, within this environment. So, mm -hmm. and then from... 
Well, I mean, I think the biggest security risk out there is that, you know, we don't know who a kid is. We don't know who the kids are. They're intermingling with uh, people of all ages, and there's really no way to know who they are. And so this is an area where I think we're going to have to really think about uh, are we going to unleash uh, what we did in the first, you know, Web 2 world um, and not and put our heads in the sand, or are we going to put gates up that actually do the job? So right now, companies uh, use age gates. Probably everybody's seen those. Um, and if they were following the rules, the gates would be a little smarter than they seem to be. You know, no back, 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 change your age, can't offload the app and come back. But some of the biggest brands that I see out there just have dumb gates, letting children uh, sort of just fib their way in. And you have to also understand that parents don't understand. And so they think that, okay, I'm gonna you know, create an account, associate my, I'm gonna, you know, watch what my child is doing. Of course, they don't know they have a Finsta account you know, behind the scenes, the fake account that they haven't told mom about. But they don't understand that the downstream effect of fibbing about your age at 10 years old and saying that you're 15 means that you know, when you are 15, you're 20, and the companies are off the hook and, uh, and parents are left with the baggage, so. You know, what I would say is that uh, the, what was this, the FPF, the um, uh, FPF came out with a, uh, an article, a study that said in 20 minutes we can collect 2 million data points. So just as an example, we play a simple game and we say, okay, head, shoulder, knees and toes, which I can hardly See, touch. you did touch your toes. I, right, you exactly. said you couldn't. <laughs> and how many data points, my height, perhaps my gender, my wingspan, you know, uh, my voice. Think of all the data points that are being collected. And you know, my neighbor's nine-year-old uh, uses the Oculus with, her mom, with the mom's Facebook account. And, uh, but she, you know, playing games, and they love this. They're boxing, um, and she thinks it's great because they're getting a workout, they're not just sitting in front of the computer. So they want, they, they're not buying these things for themselves, they're buying it for their kids. Um, so, you know, a tsunami of global regulations coming, age verification, know your uh, customer, we know that in banks, um, but do we know the age, know the age uh, of the users coming through? and the consent, the fines that are coming. So I think we have a slide that's gonna really blow your mind. So that's just the privacy regs around the globe, uh, and it's already out of date since we um, submitted this proposal. There's not time to go through all of that, but if we could move to the next slide, we'll see the ones that really matter right now. Uh, so who in the room's heard of COPPA? Okay, so that's amazing, right? It uh, was passed in 1998. It's been in place since 2000. It's what drove every child to say they're 13 and over on the internet because the age of consent in the US is 12 and under. Now that law uh, was the standalone sort of uh, law out there that would put the rules of the road out until 2018, 20 years later, the GDPR came along. Now how many of you have heard of the GDPR? Okay, I see a lot more hands rising. But you know, here we are in the US, and that is a law that came out of Europe. And within it, within the GDPR, you know, children are, are covered under that law. And their age of consent is 16. And then it can vary down to 13, depending on the jurisdiction. And then from the GDPR came the U, uh, UK's Children's Code. And that's a code. It's not a law, but it informs what the regulators would see here. It's uh, about you know, privacy by design. And then California sweeps in and says, we're going to have something very similar to that. And if you, you know, so show of hands of who knows that California's got the age appropriate design. OK, so not many. Well, that gets a little trickier because now you're going to need to uh, do something to know when you're dealing with 17 and under. Uh, and then Utah. So Utah was the first of the states. There's about 20 states looking at things right now. But when we had to submit this a month ago, Utah had just come out, yeah. right? And it's saying 17 and under parental consent. 
Uh, and, from, and since then, Arkansas just came right behind it, and we think we're gonna see it in North Carolina, and Wisconsin, Illinois, and there's gonna be constitutional battles around all of this. And then at a federal level, and on, on our side, we're looking at COSA, which I think they're gonna be talking about again this week. They tried to get it through the omnibus uh, over the winter, and it didn't go through, but again, it's addressing teens. Yeah, and just quickly jumping back to this slide here, I think a, a great point to consume on this slide here, just like all the different privacy and security regs that you do need to consider as you're developing new and different environments, you really need to think that through and what your strategy is as you come up with your different business models because there are a lot and there are, like you were just noting. And we're global, right? And it, it's, there's global variances, there's regional variances here in the US state by state. Um, so again, it's about understanding and making sure you have the right policies in place. Um, as you and, and we're going to dive in a, a, just a little bit on a few of them in just a minute. But you know, something that comes out of a lot of this is age verification, age assurance. Uh, we have a solution we're calling Age Aware. Uh, and when you think about, well, what is age verification? And you know, most of you in the room would think, okay, um, you go to create an online bank account, you go through some sort of process with your driver's license and a selfie, and uh, you know, is it really you, liveness, the whole bit? But kids don't have those sorts of credentials to go through that process. So we're seeing an emergence of biometric-based, AI-based age estimation. Now, my concern here in age estimation isn't that it can't get close, but instead of you know, talking to the parent of a 14-year-old, companies are gonna say, when they, when they you know, believe they've got a child, hey, kid, you say you're 14, you don't need your parent, just turn your camera on, we're gonna you know, just quickly make sure you're real, and we're gonna take your data points, we're not gonna keep this information, we promise, and we're gonna estimate whether you're really uh, above the age of consent. And this is really getting pushed hard out of Europe. Um, there will be instances for it, but I think we're gonna have a lot of pushback around. I just told my kid not to you know, turn his camera on and start filming himself for people he didn't know. Uh, so I think we'll see some of that. And then of course, tokenized age checking. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, privacy vaults online, the, the concept there was we need to you know, bank our information, verify who we are once, associate our loved ones, our kids, and then manage consent. And that would then lead to third parties that act as banks and can provide tokens about your already verified identity. And just on the biometric front, she gave the example of the head, shoulders, knees, and toes being able to capture over 20 million unique data points in just a 20-minute VR session. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you know, from a, if you're in, any of the folks in the room are actually designing security products, a lot of times you look at that, you're like, wow, that's a wealth of information that you can actually leverage to secure individuals from in, enhancing your your models to understand if this is the true person, is it a human, is it a person? Um, it takes you know, behavioral biometrics to the na that next level. Mm -hmm. But then if you take it, anytime you collect data, you can also remember that criminals can use that data as well to conduct more of those men in the room type of attacks that I was talking about and develop those deep fakes to create that avatar that looks like that person because now they know their wingspan. So the, the whole biometric piece behind that as we enter these, this new world will be really interesting to see from both a security and privacy perspective. That's right, Angel. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, I've got a bunch of security people in the room, most of which have never heard of COPPA, so I'm gonna give you a quick COPPA lesson. Uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, not to be confused with COPA, the Child, Child Online, Online Protection Act. This is privacy protection, and COPA was set aside because you know, so many years ago they said we didn't have a good way to verify our age and adults were being uh, marginalized, not able to get to certain content. So COPA has been the law of the land. And basically what it says is, to organizations, okay, uh, it says, before you collect user disclose personally identifiable information collected directly from a child under the age of 13, you must first obtain verifiable parental consent. And consent is informed consent. So your privacy policy, pointing people to a privacy policy isn't enough, you need discrete notices. 
So packed in that COPPA is what is personally identifiable information. Well, in the kids' space, if you have a login credential that has an email for password reset, you've got personally identifiable information. There are ways to create accounts for children. You hash that email, and then no longer is it considered PII. You have an exception for it. And it's a risk-based law, uh, although people didn't refer to it that way. So, um, you know, it, when it first came out, everybody thought, okay, it's just websites. Then mobile apps came, and they said for years and years and years, well, it doesn't apply to us. And then education, all the apps going into the education environment, right? The teachers dragging the apps in. Nobody's actually looked at the security features or the privacy features of those. Those are commercial organizations collecting data. And what were they trying to do? Push it onto the school to process the parental consent but the parent actually never is part of the process and therefore can't uh, invoke their parental rights. So COPPA is pretty clear that you need to use reasonable methods in light of available technology to ensure the person you're prov that's providing the consent is actually the parent or guardian. Nobody's doing a good job at that. We haven't gotten there yet. So 20 years later, all the smart people that we have in technology, and we still haven't gotten to where we're actually uh, binding the parent-child relationship and making it more meaningful. Yeah. Now, Angel, I would say most people aren't um, you know, claiming this kid yeah. and then permissioning them on because the kid can just do it themselves easily enough uh, with, with the rule that we have now. Yeah. I now, actually, uh, I, we, when we were talking about this, I, I was using it as an example that um, things are well intended, like with the, the ed tech stuff that's going on. However, I don't know if any of you have um, children who play youth football or coach a youth football team. Anyone involved with football, youth football programs in the past? Well, they have this thing where, you know, for my sons who played and my husband actually coached, we would have to, he would have to collect the kid's report card, their health record, um, a whole slew of things. And so the coaches before each game, you know, for a bunch of 12 year olds playing football would go up and they compare the books. Is Johnny actually 12? He's not 18 playing football because, you know, everyone's cheating with you. It's so football. competitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that they don't, a lot of those coaches have all these books with all this paper and that they just leave at their house or leave, you know, hand off to the, the football boards afterwards. And the, it's all well intended. They want to do the right thing. It's, and so it's almost like the equivalent of this, where people in that early stage, they want to do the right thing, and the, and the educational systems are doing the right thing by providing new and different ways to learn, but not fully understanding what they're disclosing on a lot of the kids, too, during that process. And, and you know, you took the football example, right? But the Girl Scout troop leader has your kid's medical records sitting in the living room. Everybody's now working from home, so it's just all of this is easily accessible, but it's all the after school programs, the summer camps, anything you wanna get your child involved in, you're handing more data, more data, more data to people that many, the not-for-profits aren't, aren't covered under any of these regulations, right? But they're the worst for collecting data, not securing it properly, and letting it ooze out. So it's a real issue offline, and it's been that way for so long. We haven't solved that. We've had the chance to solve online. It's time to get it solved across across, uh, across both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so go to the next slide. So, you know, California's Age Appropriate Design Code Act. You just need to do a better job of knowing um, whether or not you've got a minor 17 and under. And there's some thresholds about which companies are required to comply, you know, by a certain amount of revenue. But this is causing a lot of issues out there because, again, COPPA was 12 and under. Everybody just magically was 13 and over. Nobody really worried too much about it. But now they can't do without the teenagers. They have a lot of money and they do a lot of activity. They drive a lot of purchasing in the home, right? So teens are really important. So here's one key thing. They have to opt in to being tracked, right? So we don't. We'd like to, they're working on privacy regulation across the country, but this is going to say you have to actually now know you're dealing with a teenager and then give them a different flow. So it's being challenged by uh, one of the big advocacy uh, or lobbying groups, which is you know backed by the technology companies. And uh, they may very well 
win on some of the constitutionality, but it's not gonna be for a couple of years. And if you're building a metaverse or going into something, that's a long lead time, right? And you can't wait and hope it's all gonna go away because even if they win, it'll just tweak it a little bit. And all the rest of these states coming at us, um, it's gonna just be an onslaught. It's gonna be really hard to keep punching back on these rules. What's the next slide? Right, so next slide, Utah. And Utah, and so I, I briefly touched on this. Okay, curfew, 1030, no more social media. Social media accounts. Isn't that kind of a good thing? Like I, I try to put parental controls on my kids' devices and like somehow they feel Yeah, but so now that. they're gonna now put it on the, on the companies, right? <laughs> But uh, seven, now it's, it's addressing social media, 100 million in revenue or more. So obviously they're going after the big boys. But in innovation, you know, in a, in a time of innovation, the little guy can just blow up and become the big guy, right? That's how the big guys got where they are now. So are you gonna build it thinking I'm not, I don't have to deal with this and then blow up and have to unwind everything that you've done? We just saw um, a fine come out with Epic Games Fortnite uh, which some of you may have heard of before. And they just paid a half a billion dollar fine for violating children's privacy and dark patterns, you know, sort of convincing them to stay in. And I, and I believe that they probably had four times that set aside for that fine. That's the, you know, I don't think companies are gonna be able to and the VCs are gonna be able to continue to fund fines now that they've reached that level. But just behind Utah, because it's 17 and under, so 17 and under needs parental consent for a social media account if the social media service is doing 100 million or more in revenue. It's gonna cause a lot of fighting at the din dinner room, t you know, at the yeah. dining room table. Yeah. So just behind this came Arkansas. They just, uh, they just filed something very similar. And it goes into place for new accounts starting in September. September, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and by the way, this isn't just for entertainment and games. If you're a, a big box store, and you have um, people buying electronic goods, and you have customer service, and kids are calling into your customer service, once you know it's a child, all these rules apply. So, you know, I would say that the companies that don't think they're necessarily attracting children still need to do some data hygiene to look and see, is there a chance I've got that? Start looking like at the OFAC list. Oh, do I have any fraudsters in my database? They need to be looking for kids as well. So concerns around, let's see. Um, oh, well, anybody have any concerns about age verification? Concerned about having to do it every place you go to protect her child, right? And how many of these companies are going to emerge? Who's auditing them? Do we, you know, and the people have the best intentions. So, I, I, you know, I'm a believer. I, I think that we first need to make the internet more age aware let parents have a say, just tell us the age of your kids so that we can promote that signal to these services that minors are at the door and put better gates in before they get to a point where they've got to age verify everyone, every place they go. And of course, it'll become a commodity and we'll look for our banks and other you know, trusted um, in, uh, relationships to help verify us and then use that uh, in a federated fashion. So. This is uh, you know, parent consent, it's another one. It's not easy. So I don't know how many of you are parents. Most of you, if you are and you haven't heard of COPPA, that means nobody's asked you for your permission, but your kid might have a TikTok account, a Facebook account. I mean, 48% of kids 10 to 12 years old logged into TikTok last week. And believe me, they didn't log in with a draft account that does absolutely nothing. They logged in with an account that's full blown. And once you are 13 right now until the rest of these rules kick in, it is game on. You might as well be 33 years old what, what's uh, allowed yeah. to happen in this space. Yeah. So this is our sliding scale. It just tries to give people an idea that under COPPA, you know, GDPR is a risk-based law, but so is COPPA really, and nobody, you know, really talked about it, but it just says that you can get started by allowing kids to have an account. The thing about hashing the email, if you don't want to deal with the parent for contests and newsletters and uh, rewards programs, you can really do low-level parental consent. I mean, hey kid, what is your parent's email? Uh, and, you know, sometimes you get a real email for a parent. Not all kids are liars out of the gate, uh, but you know many are, so you have to do the normal fraud things, right? Did this email account just get created yesterday? I'm not gonna buy that it's a parent account. 
Uh, and then you can slide your way up. So as you have features and functionality that trigger other data collection and trigger these laws, you can sort of slide your way up. But when you get to the point where you're letting children share their personal information, interact with others in some way where they can just communicate their own personal information, now you've reached a point where you have to have some identity proofing. And while the identity proofing on that last slide was all very you know, serious, you know, six years ago, I got approved at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I, you know, created a method under our Safe Harbor program and submitted it to them, and they accepted it. We just saw it come up in LinkedIn last week, and that is, if I can white label, if I can create a white list of domains that I don't believe hire minors, so .gov, you know, Lockheed Martin. You know, I wouldn't do Target, right, because they hire minors. And if I can get your name in that email, send you an email to your work domain, bring a six-digit code back, then I'm going to provide you your parental rights online because you've at least gotten to this phase of you're likely to be an adult, and I didn't have to ask you to pull out your driver's license or passport and store that and ship that around. Yeah. All right, so we covered a lot. How much time do we have left? Well, clearly, both of us can talk forever. Ten minutes. All right. So. We're gonna to try to summarize it here of kind of five best practices you can take back home. So the first advice would be treat your metaverse strategy as you would another channel. You have your web channel, you have your mobile channel, this is another channel. So that means your, your, your security strategy, your privacy strategy, as well as your business models, consider it another channel within your strategy, not a unique one. And also that allows you the ability to truly know your customer and know how they're engaging in each channel. Again, from a cybersecurity perspective, we know that a lot of times criminals will game one channel to go after the other channel, and you should expect that as you come out with your business strategy for the metaverse. So I'd recommend as you go back, when you meet with your um, biz dev folks, your product folks, you know, come up with a treatment of this as another channel. And then, Understand the threat landscape. So we, we talked about a variety of different attacks that are happening today, and expect more to occur as those mature, right? And you know, I gave the example of deep fakes and doppelgangers in, in the metaverse. The FTC is already giving fines because it, it has indicated that you cannot manipulate based upon leveraging deep fakes and doppelgangers. We're already seeing Interpol create the metaverse global police because they are so concerned about that. So this is real, so understand those threats. And the identity and privacy from the start, so as you're building it out, think about what your identity strategy is and what does that mean to you within the context of your business, again, across all channels, and think about what the opportunity is to leverage more of that decentralized model, take advantage of some of those identity attributes that you can leverage as a user goes from one room to another room within a metaverse environment. This is, you're in a big community, you're going into one room, and that room might be the bar where the parents are hanging out, have that age verification mm -hmm. at the door type of thing. And it may be double doors, right? I mean, the world isn't one doorway in, so the metaverse platform that you have brought your brand into may or may not do a great job on the front end. You would hope that they might, but you don't, again, want them age verifying everybody the moment they come in necessarily. But if you have a bar, if you have a situation, you may have to invoke your own next step to make sure you're protected because it's your brand that's in somebody else's potential world. And, uh, and perception is reality. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then as Denise mentioned, assume the privacy regs, even though they don't say metaverse in them, apply in this world too. So all the regs you just went through, assume they apply within the metaverse. Assume if you're collecting credit card information in this channel, PCI applies. So don't wait for the regulators to tell you what to do. Regulators often don't know what they're regulating. I'm gonna mm -hmm. repeat that. Regulators don't know what they're regulating. And that's not a slight on them, it's actually, technology changes so quickly, so it's on all of us, everyone in this room, to make sure we're educating the regulators so that they are creating appropriate um, regulations for us to engage with. But don't wait for them, because they're always behind. 
So assume what's out there today applies to you and you will be fine if you do not comply with the existing ones in this channel. That's why treat it as a channel. Um, the other thing too, from a identity perspective, you know, think about the models you're using today from a continuous auth. So you, as you can continuously use that continuous auth as you go through the different environments, but also think about transferable identity attributes. Again, metaverse is not intended to be a whole bunch of metaverse. It's supposed to be the theory or the vision is this one environment where you can have interoperability across these different worlds. So you can use that currency. So this, the, the sneakers I buy here in San Francisco, when I get back to Boston, I can wear those sneakers again and not only have to buy a new pair of sneakers and I only wear them in Boston. And I can use that same currency and I can use those same identity attributes, but only share the ones I want to share as I navigate from world to world to world and have more control of that. So again, a lot of that is visionary right now, and that's, we started with, we don't know what the metaverse is, and because it's still in that visionary mm -hmm. mode, the standards aren't out there, the interoperability isn't really out there right now. Um, the, this is a whole ecosystem of third parties, so as you're developing your SBOM or your software bill of material and looking at ways you're integrating with all these third parties, keep that in mind too. And finally, it is not a do-it-yourself project. There's a lot of great industry associations out there that are trying to come up with good frameworks, with good standards, with interoperability ideas. And I encourage you to get engaged with them. Um, and we have a whole list of resources in this um, that we can go through. But to start, we have a nice list of a checklist of questions you can kind of go back and use as a foundation to mind map what's needed as you create your environment. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give a couple examples of uh, types of, I don't think we have time to go through all Yeah, no, we probably don't have time to go, but this is a really good short checklist. Please do take it and, and look at your own services. And you know, just getting back to the W3 versus W2, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be one or the other for a very long time, right? And so verify, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and you know, the wallet that is intended to traverse the world um, and the attributes that need, you're also able to now, you know, who, you've gotta make sure that the wallet providers and everybody involved in the ecosystem. One example in the slide before about the ecosystem in the children's space is that you, if you are deemed directed to children, or if you, which means your primary audience or mixed audience. A mixed audience can use the age gate, primary audience cannot. You have to go and configure yourself at all the ad networks, all the third parties, and make sure that they know downstream when you send them data, it's only to be used to provide the service, capping of you know, uh, whatever it might be, and, that, and that now they're on the hook. But if you don't tell them, it's on you, and you've now shared kids' information with the service providers that are part of the ecosystem. So, um, you know, just I think we we're probably have said it a million times, right, wrapping up here. Um, understand your identity and compliance strategy. Most people don't have a parent-child relationship database established. When you do bring child data into your system and you commingle that with adult data, so oh, by the way, hi, adults register for the 10-year-olds, I get out of these laws. No, nope. the minute you give them a login, a piece of passive information gets collected, added to the parent data, you've now contaminated all of the data. It's all covered under the regulation and it's gonna limit what you can do. So look to identity services that may be able to handle the kid account separate from your adult account, provide some separation and the like. Don't try to do all this identity verification on your own, you'll drive the parents crazy. Think of you know sort of managing that consent across and uh, within six months, we're saying, you know, get involved with the metaverse uh, industry standards and initiatives. Somebody in your organization, find who's interested in this and make sure that you've, you're really understanding what they're coming up with as those standards. Mm -hmm. And these are some examples of the different standards and groups that you could explore and learn more about afterwards. Um, I know we have like next to no time for questions. Um, we covered a lot, but if we do have questions, we're happy to take them. Well, to wrap, we clearly um, covered a lot. I think we're both cautiously optimistic about the future of the vision for Web3 and Metaverse. Hopefully next year when we come back to RSA conference, we'll be able to actually know what we're talking about uh, and what it actually means. 
And so we look forward to have that conversation, but if you, questions do come up over the, uh, after the conference, feel free to reach out to either of us. We're happy to continue the conversation because it is such an evolving space um, from both a security and privacy perspective. So thank you. I appreciate you guys getting out of bed this morning on the last day of the conference. So thank you for coming. We thank appreciate you. it.